All right, let's get started. Um, here's the, uh, the sign-in sheet. I'm getting that passed around. Okay, so a couple quick things. So homework one should be posted and should be active on Blackboard. It's not due for a while. It's not due till not Monday, but the following Monday, so you got plenty of time on it. Um, and I'll bring it up and, and mention a few things with it uh, during lecture. Uh, that's posted online. There are three problems. Uh, the first two problems are, are the ones that, that are comprise the bulk of the assignment. The third one's really quick, and um, we'll talk about that today. Um, let's talk about senior design, uh, the senior design process for next uh, semester. So um, I went through and did an analysis of, well, basically every civil engineering student in the program to figure out who needs uh, what in order to get into senior design. Most, in all honesty, all honesty, but most of the students in this class who want to get into senior design next semester qualify to get into senior design regardless of if you're on the old or the new curriculum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be sending an email probably sometime later today that it'll, it'll either say you're good, you're, you're good to get into senior design, or if you take senior design next semester, just make sure that you're taking this as well. Because to, uh, if, to, for instance, if you're on the new curriculum, to get into senior design, you have to have four breadth courses and one design course, or three breadth courses and two design courses. And for some of you, you might have to take a design course, like you might have to take foundations at the same time you're taking 452 in order to qualify to get in. So, but for, for most of you, uh, it's not a big deal either way. Just I, I'll send an email out later on, uh, and that, that'll clarify everything. Again, for most people, it doesn't matter. So, um, If you want to switch to the new curriculum, the best person to talk to would be uh, Associate Dean Hanrahan. But let me also say this. Um, it's not a time-sensitive issue, especially with 452. Uh, and, and again, it's also not a time-sensitive issue for, for just about everybody in the room. For those of you that need to take senior design uh, next year, you're either fine now or you just have to make sure you have to take like an additional class. And that's pretty much the same for whether or not you're on the old or the new curriculum. So it's, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, so yeah. Uh, I think there is paperwork that needs to be done, but I think they have it up there. So. That's what I'm saying. It, 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 yes, you don't have to bring something. You just have to go and, and do it. So yeah. Sound good? All right. So sign-in sheets passed around, uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and, and get back into lecture. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to continue my discussion on loads, then we'll get into load combinations, and that'll probably call it for, uh, for what we're talking about today. Um, when we come back from our, uh, 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 our longer weekend on Wednesday, we'll actually start getting into some concrete uh, topics uh, then. So let me, uh, let me sort of recap where we left off last time and where we're headed. So uh, last time, if you recall, we did our load takedown uh, of this frame. So basically, we had a, a framing system with a just a basic PSF uh, load on it. Based on that load, we were able to take that down into looking at um, uh, looking at let's say uh, the bending moment and shear on a given beam, the axial load on a given column, looking at uh, load transfer on girders, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Anybody have any questions on that? Is, was that good? Okay. So um, we started to break down the individual uh, types of loads that we deal with uh, in civil engineering. We started off talking about dead loads. Um, by and large, these are two of the most fundamental numbers that uh, you know, two of the most fundamental numbers that structural engineers need to uh, recognize: the unit weight of uh, steel and the unit weight of reinforced concrete. Now, remember that unit weight of reinforced concrete, that 150 pounds per, per cubic foot. A, that is an estimate. I mean, uh, those of you that had civil engineering materials last semester should know that re uh, concrete is a variable material. But uh, this is sort of on the upper bound of what you would expect with, uh, with normal weight concrete with reinforcement added into it. So normal weight concrete tends to be around 145 pounds per cubic foot. We add a little bit more to account for the fact that there's rebar, and rebar is made of steel, and steel is heavier. So 150 pounds per cubic foot for reinforced concrete is a very, very common uh, assumption. Remember, if, if, you, if you're dealing with other materials, you can either get them from a, uh, uh, a document like ASC 7, or you can just call the manufacturers. Um, 
La the last thing that we talked about was beam self-weight. This is something we will deal with throughout the semester, so it is a computation I really want you all to be uh, aware of. If you want to calculate the total weight of a beam, just the total weight of a beam, it would be the unit weight times the volume. So if I had a beam like this, I'd take the unit weight times the volume, which, the, which is width times height times length, so uh, gamma times BHL. All right, now that'll give me the total weight of the beam. So the weight per foot is basically a weight per unit length. So weight per unit length is basically taking this computation and dividing it by the length, so the length cancels. So you're basically taking the unit weight and multiplying it by the area. So if you take the unit weight of that material and multiply it by the cross-sectional area, that will give you the weight of this beam per foot. So if you've got a simply supported beam and you know, uh, it's, a, you know it's a unit weight, it, you know, let's say it's reinforced concrete and you know its dimensions, you can determine the weight per foot of that beam. So you can determine that uniformly distributed load being applied uh, over the section. Does that make sense? Any questions? All right. Let's talk about live loads. Okay. So what are the difference between dead loads and live loads? Well, dead loads are permanent stationary loads that, for the most part, uh, comprise the structure's self-weight. I mean, yeah, I mean, any permanent fixed attachments would be characterized as dead loads, but, but really the difference between dead loads and live loads is live loads are related to a structure's occupancy. In other words, what's it being used for, okay? Live loads for a classroom or a school are going to be different than live loads for a hotel or live loads for a hospital, or live loads for a, uh, uh, an office building, uh, et cetera. So, like for instance, um, you know, office buildings. Um, let, let, let's look at some of these numbers. I'm curious about this. So if I look at office buildings, um, if I'm designing the offices, the offices would be designed for a floor load of 50 pounds per square foot. But if I'm looking at the hallways, the corridors, the corridors are designed for a live load of 80 pounds per square foot. Now, does it make sense that the hallways have a heavier load than the offices? I mean, think about it. Hallways tend to have more people in it. Also, what happens if there's something like, oh, I don't know, a fire, you know? What happens if there's a fire and then you, know, got, you have a much more concentrated uh, number of people in the hallway? So hallways tend to make, um, it tends to make sense that you design them for a heavier load. One trick that a lot of structural engineers uh, tend to use when they're designing uh, is this. So let's say I am a developer and I'm wanting to build a commercial office building um, for, uh, for use for anybody who wants to rent out some office space. So I'm sure uh, uh, some of you have been in a commercial office building before, so you know you go to the third floor and there might be an accountant, you know, taking up some space on that floor, or there's a law office, or there's a, uh, 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 you know, an outpatient surgical facility, or what have you. And you have this general office building, and it's being used by different clients for different spaces, right? Well, you know, if I'm the developer and I'm wanting to rent this space out at so many dollars per square foot, I don't want my hands tied, you know, by the geometry of the building. In other words, I want to rent this space out, but that has to be the hallway and that has to be the office space. So what I might do is tell the structural engineer, why don't you design the entire floor system as if it was one big hallway? Instead of using 50 pounds per square foot, use 80 pounds per square foot everywhere. That way I, as the developer, can start slicing off that floor space to whoever wants it. If Larry Luttrell Accounting wants 800 square foot, they can take that 800 square foot and arrange their office however they want. And I know that the floor system will be able to withstand it. Does that make sense? A little conservative, but again, it's all about what's your intended use. Now, the design of a building like that would be incredibly different than the design of, let's say, the Weisberg Applied Engineering Complex here at Marshall. Because when you're looking at the floor plan for this building, it's very clear where the classrooms are, where the hallways are, where the faculty offices are, where the computer labs are, et cetera there's a little bit less chance that this floor system is going to get rearranged as opposed to something like a commercial office building. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, so the question was, would the convenience of doing that outweigh the, the economics of it? Um, it, it depends. I mean, uh, you got to keep in mind, if you're a developer, you know, once you've paid for the initial cost of the building, now all you're getting is rent. 
You know what I mean? That's just more money. So I'd say in, ge in general, no. But, but it, again, it also depends on the project. I mean, I, I use uh, 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 the school, you know, as a for instance. Let's use one that's a lot more rigid, like a hotel, okay? Very rare that, you know, a hotel is going to undergo significant floor plan changes. It's either going to be a hallway or a hotel room. You, you see what I mean? But for an office building, that, that really can change quite a bit. But it just depends on the use. So. Any other questions? Okay. Now, now one of the things about these numbers is I see 50 pounds per square foot. I got to be honest with you. You know, when I first started learning this stuff, I, was, I don't know what the heck 50 pounds per square foot even means. But I figure it's a good idea to actually show you. Okay. So this actually comes from the LRFD pedestrian, uh, or, uh, design guide for designing pedestrian bridges. And this is from the commentary. What, what we've got here is a, a, a roped off square. This is about six feet by six feet. And this will kind of give you an idea of what 50 pounds per square foot looks like. Now, this is average. It's not, you know, not exact. But if you have about 12 people in a square that, that's, that's 50 foot by, uh, or, that, or six foot by six foot, that's about 50 pounds per square foot. This is 50 pounds per square foot. This is 100 pounds per square foot. And this is what 150 pounds per square foot would look like, okay? So that's a lot of people, okay? That's a lot of people, okay? But let's, let's just even tone it down to, to 50 pounds per square foot. This would be a very reasonable floor load for, let's say, an office, okay? Now, let's sort of extend that out a little bit, okay? Let's, let's take, I mean, a, a number of you have been to my office. Have I ever had, like, like you know, take the square footage of, of my office and multiply it by this. Have I ever had that many people in my office? I know I'm a nice guy, but I'm not that nice. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, the, the point I'm making uh, is this. These live loads that are being prescribed, these live loads that are being prescribed are upper limits. But th the question I'd like to ask you is what's the probability that this floor system is going to see these design loads applied everywhere all at the same time? And if you take a 50 pounds per square foot live load, and let's say apply it to this room. Do the math. How many people do you think that would be in this room? You're talking about hundreds of people in this room. I mean, is this room really ever going to see like 150 some odd people? No, you know. It's, it, those are upper bound estimates. But there is a question, it, what is the, what's the probability that, th that this floor system is really going to see that load? The answer is, it, it's not likely, okay? So if, if you take, here, here's some numbers for you. If you take 40 pounds per square foot, I did the math. If you take 40 pounds per square foot and you look at this room, okay, that comes out to like a little over 100 people, okay. The fire marshal wouldn't let that happen, you know. Fire marshal has has an explicit limit on how many people can be in this room. So that's just not going to happen, okay. So what we're going to talk about now is is a process called live load reduction. Live load reduction is is performed in order to reduce this load to a more realistic value uh, uh, based on the probability of full loading. Now, I'm going to show you this equation and, and, and I want to sort of give you a little bit of a disclaimer. Okay? Um, how many of you have heard the term empirical equation before? You heard that term before? Okay. All right. If you haven't, um, there is a difference between what I, what I call mechanistic equations and empirical equations. Now, a mechanistic equation is, you know, take some, some statics or mechanics of deformable bodies, throw some calculus at it, derive, 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 bam, there's your answer. Something I can derive, something I can prove, something I can uh, theoretically develop. That, that's, that would be a mechanistic equation, something that, that I can actually derive. An empirical equation, this is not derivable, okay? That's not what this is. This equation comes from, from curve fitting. It comes from going out in the field, collecting data, uh, analyzing that data and fitting an equation that best represents that data. Okay, so so you know there's a lot of you who are going to say, well, units, and then try and 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 try and uh, ascertain like behavioral observations when sometimes they're there and sometimes they're not. Okay, but the long and short of it is this equation gives you a, a good idea of you know the difference between you know upper bound loads that would be prescribed by a specification and what you're actually seeing on the structure. So, so what you would do is you would take L sub naught. L sub naught would be the live load that would be prescribed for a given floor system. So L sub naught would be like what you get here. So offices, let's say 
50 pounds per square foot. 50 pounds per square foot would be your L sub naught, your unreduced live load. You would take that unreduced live load and you would multiply it by the quantity that you see in parentheses, 0.25 plus T over the square root of KLLAT, and we'll talk about that here in a second. And what that will do is take that unreduced live load and reduce it a bit and give you a quantity that you can actually use for calculation. So, that, so for instance, you might the load, it might be 80 pounds per square foot, but after reduction, it's something like 65 or 64 pounds per square foot. And that would be the load that you would then distribute using tributary area and factor, uh, et cetera. Uh, a couple things. Number one, um, uh, live load reduction does not apply for the following cases. So for the first case, this, this term under the square root, if it's less than or equal to 400 square foot, you don't use live load reduction. In other words, if you're talking about the design of an element where the tributary area is so small that it doesn't matter anyways, just don't bother, okay? So, so, so part one, you don't apply live load reduction if you have a relatively small tributary area. Point two, you also don't apply live load reduction when you have really heavy loads. Let, let, let's go back to the classroom setting, okay? What's the probability that this classroom would see you know, over 100 people in it. Pretty low, okay? But let me ask a second question. What's the probability that Drinko Library is gonna see the 150 pounds per square foot that I'm, I'm prescribing? Pretty high because of the book stacks, right? The book stacks aren't going anywhere. So Drinko Library really is seeing that 150 pounds per square foot. So anytime you have a live load that's over 100 pounds per square foot, you don't apply live load reduction. You just use the load as is. Yes, sir? Yeah, uh, the question is, would they be live loads because they're expected to be there? The, the answer is yes, because of two reasons. A, I mean, even even the the, uh, the book loads themselves can be variable. I mean, there's a difference between a bookshelf that's full and a bookshelf that's empty. Uh, and two, it's related to occupancy. It's what we're using the structure for. You see what I mean? All right, uh, you and you. Uh, or. I, I don't understand. Can, so, like, uh, I know, like, if you have a section of your school, and it might actually be a lot of people, like, if you're trying to, like, get more people, kind of thing. But you get a lot of people. You mean, you mean like, if there's a student that, that, that smells bad and everybody wants to get on the other side of the room? Something. Something yeah. like that. But, like, uh, you know, maybe not the whole room's full, but one side. Could but is that going to be that way forever? You, you, also have to, you also have to consider that. We're talking about loads that are sustained throughout the structure's life, and I don't think that's going to be the case. One other point, let me, let me add to this. Um, we're talking about loads that haven't even been factored yet. We're going to take these live loads, once they've been assessed, we're going to bump them up 60% to account for uncertainty. So you've got to keep, keep that in mind as well. Remember, we have load factors that we haven't even talked about yet. So. Yeah, so the question is, shouldn't you know what's going to be? Yes, yes, you should. I mean, if, let, let me say this. If I'm a structural engineer and I'm designing an office building and somebody tells me halfway through the project, oh, we're just going to turn this into a library. I'm going to go, excuse me? Like, like, <laughs> no, you're not. Or, or, or you're going to, you know, you're going to completely change the, the, the structure or whatnot or anything because that, that's going to become a problem, okay? So, so the short answer is, you, you have to have some idea of the intended use of the structure or you're not going to be able to accurately design it. That, did I kind of answer your question? Okay. Anybody else? This is good stuff. Okay. Um, a, a couple other things. Th this is an empirical relationship. Okay. This is an empirical relationship. So because of that and because it is just an equation and equations can give you weird answers if you plug weird values into it, there are some other limits that you need to be aware of. So if you have a member that only supports one floor of load, that reduction is limited to 50%. So if you have you know, 80 pounds per square foot on a, on a beam, and let's say yeah, that beam's only supporting one floor's worth of load, and you do the math, and that 80 pounds per square foot gets reduced to 12, I mean, it's, it's an equation. You can plug values in and get, get weird answers. The spec says, no, 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 no. I don't care what you get, that's limited to 40. So you can't, you couldn't go below 40. Does that make sense? So 
That's limited to members supporting only one floor. For multiple floors, it's 0.4. What's the difference between a member that supports only one floor of load versus a member that supports multiple floors of load? What would be an example of a member that supports multiple floors of load? A column, exactly. So basically we're talking about beams and columns, but the code likes to speak in very generic terms in case you have like a shear wall or something like that that's supporting multiple floors of load. Does that make sense? Now let's talk about these live load element factors uh, and what have you, this KLL. Um, KLL terms are our live load element factors that will help you, that will assist live load reduction uh, and they change based on what type of element that you're talking about. Now, to keep it simple, the two ones that you really need to remember is that for beams, your live load element factor is two. For columns, your live load element factor is four. Okay? And let me explain what a live load element factor is. Okay? Let's take a look at some floor beams, okay? some interior floor beams on this structure. Would you agree that the tributary area for an interior floor beam looks something like this. Would you agree with that? Halfway over. So I'm going to call this the tributary area. Okay. Now the tributary area is defined as halfway over. Okay. Now there is another term called the influence area. The difference between the tributary area and the influence area is that if the tributary area is halfway over, the influence area is all the way over. So if I was looking at another representative floor beam, this would be the influence area. This is the influence area. Now let me ask you a question. If I were to take the size of the blue rectangle and divide it by the size of the red rectangle, what would I get? Two, what's the live load element factor for interior beams? Two, that's what it is, okay? So if you're wondering what a live load element factor is, it's just a relationship between the influence area and the tributary area, okay? And, and to get, I don't want you to get too married into getting into specific details because this is where curve fitting comes into play. This, come, this is where, you know, you go and you inf, uh, instrument a bunch of structures and you see there's a trend in the data between influence area and live load reduction and so that, that that's where you fit your equation off of. Now, let me ask you this. Would you agree that if I was looking at column B2, so let me erase this. Oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm just going to use a different color. Would you agree that if I was looking at column, let's say, B2, the tributary area would look something like this, right? Something about like that? Oh, hold on. Ah. Well, forgive me, my scale is a little off. But the tributary area like this actually should be going between here and here, so bear with me. That's what the tributary area would be. The influence area would be the whole frame, like from A to C and from 1 to 3. What would the ratio between the influence area and the tributary area be? Be 4. That's why for columns, KLL is 4. So the ones that you really need to remember for columns, it's 4. For, for beams, it's 2. Does that make sense? I just want to give you kind of an idea of where this is coming from. Well, well, hold on, hold on. Look, it, it'd still be four though, because, and, and that's that's what you have here, this exterior column without cantilever slabs. Like, like for instance, if you have, like, if I look at this corner column, like here's the, the interior, or here's the tributary area, here's the influence area. That's where you're getting the right ratio of four. Now. What gets a little tricky and what gets a little complicated is what are called cantilever slabs. And basically what that means is if you had a little bit of floor slab sort of sticking out here, like if you had a canopy or something, and it doesn't quite come out exact, so that's why they say just go with three or something like that. Does that make sense? That's a good question, though. That's a good question. Everybody else okay with this? It's, it, well, th uh, the, the question, uh, so what about girders? Well, think. You know, here's your tributary area, here's your influence area, what's it going to be? It's going to be two. Yep. Make sense? Any questions? This is good stuff. All right. Now, 
Let's talk about something we're not getting this January, or at least we haven't gotten here recently. And that's snow. Hold on. Better erase that. Well, we, we, had, we, we got some really cold weather, but we haven't really gotten much snow. Of course, I say that, and then everybody's like, way to go, Dr. Mike, on Saturday or, or something. It'll start and get a blizzard or something. Um, let's talk a little bit about snow and where snow loads come from. So obviously, so we're getting into environmental impacts, okay? Obviously, snow loads depend upon where we're at. We're going to have a different specified snow load in Huntington, West Virginia than we are in, say, Miami, Florida, or than we are in, say, Anchorage, Alaska, okay? So obviously, the, the snow load that we get depends upon where we're at. Um, the, the United States has a snow load map, and I'm going to show you a simpler way to interpret that here in a second, but the United States has a snow load map that dependent upon where you're at, will tell you your ground snow load. There's also one state that has, there's one state in the United States that has its own snow map. Which state would have its own <laughs> snow map? Alaska. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> they don't have their own snow map. That's all I'll say. I, okay, all right. So, ju just so you are... <laughs> Just so you are aware, the snow that we use for structural design purposes is what's called the 50-year snow. How many of you all have heard of the 100-year flood? Or that? Okay, all right. So the 50-year snow is based on the probability that that snow will have a mean recurrence interval of 50 years. So just so you're aware of where the snow, or like what snow value are we using, that's where it's coming from. Now, now if you look at the snow map, it, it's a... It's a mess, okay? This is the map that comes straight out of uh, ASCE 7. It, it's a mess, okay? Um, I would have a difficult time interpreting what is the actual snow load for a given area. Luckily, there's some folks that have actually developed an online design tool. This thing's really nifty. Um, I'm going to show you all how this works right now. This tool has basically digitized the ASCE 7 snow maps and will tell you what the snow load is for a given area. For instance, okay. Sorry, Microsoft. We're not using Microsoft Edge today. Okay. So this is the Applied Technology Council, and what they will do, what they've done, is basically identified a. Um, uh, uh, they basically digitized the snow maps for, for for structural engineers to determine design loads. Now. What I have found is it, this website tends to work a lot better if you use latitudes and longitudes uh, for your given location. So, so let's, let's, let's do this. We are at Marshall University, so let's go to Google. Here, I'll, I'll do it here so I can see what I'm doing. Let's go to Google and let's search Marshall University latitude and longitude. And, I mean, Google's wonderful thing. It will tell you the latitude and longitude of Marshall University. So here's the latitude and longitude of Marshall University. So we're at about 38.4 degrees north, and we're about 82.4 degrees uh, west. What I'm going to do is I'm going to enter this data into uh, my, my snow load map, and it'll tell me what the snow load is in this given area. The one thing to keep in mind, you know, this is based off of, you know, an XY coordinate system. So, so think about this. In an XY coordinate system, north goes up, right? So north is positive, south is negative. So you would, so when you do your latitude and longitude, you'd enter positive 38.4325, but you'd enter in negative 82.4 because that's west, that's going left on, on a coordinate system. Y'all see what I mean? Okay. So what we'll do is we'll say, all right, let's do this. Latitude, longitude, negative, and bam. So what, what you're going to see is you're going to see this, this map, and you're going to see this weird splotchy looking thing on the map. And that is basically the, uh, that's the snow region for, for where we're at. So if you notice, the map's a little, little out there. So that's the snow uh, region for this map. Okay, so everywhere that's in this zone has the same ground snow load, and our ground snow load is 20 pounds per square foot, okay? 
So that would be the first step is to actually determine what is the snow load in our area. Do, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Yes. Uh, that's a good question. The question is, uh, is ice. Um, what, what I will say is this. I, I'll, I'll, let me say a couple things about that. Okay. Number one, there is something to be said about the difference between, you know, an average 50-year snow and then what you actually get one year. Like, like I'm thinking of what's happened with flooding in Houston here recently. I mean, um, you know, Houston water systems were designed for X number of, of, of cubic feet per second of water, and then they get a storm that's way above and beyond that, so they, they totally don't expect it. Okay, so that, that would be point one. Um, point two, um, there are ways of dealing with ice. We typically don't, don't handle that with, with what we're dealing here. Let me give you some numbers. Um, 20 pounds per square foot, if you do the math based on the conditions in our area, is something around the order of like eight to nine inches of snow. So we're talking about a collected eight to nine inches of snow on a roof that hasn't even been factored for, for um, uncertainty. Do you see what I mean? So there, there's something to, to keep in mind. So the answer is, is typically no. For most commercial structures, we assume that we've got adequate drainage, you know, et cetera. But we're, we're also, you know, there is something to be said where we're designing for, you know, a certain recurrence interval. And if we get something that's crazy, it's sort of out of our hand, you know. You design a floor for 80 pounds per square foot and it gets 800. You know what I mean? So. Any other questions? All right. Now, one of the things that, that you got to keep in mind when you, um, when you design uh, for, for snow is that the first step is to determine ground snow load. That, that's what this is. This is the average snow load that's on the ground. Okay? But if I'm designing a building, I think I might be more interested in what's the snow load on the roof, okay? There is a difference between the snow load that you get on the ground and the snow that you get on the roof. Typically, because of wind and because of, you know, environmental effects, you end up accumulating on average less snow on the roof than you do on the ground, okay? Uh, and, and there's a few factors that, that go into that. So what you, so if, in order to determine the snow load for, for flat roofs, and, and right off the bat, let, let me go ahead and answer this. Most commercial large-scale structures that we're designing nowadays typically have flat roofs, or what I'll say, flat-ish roofs. Like, the, you know, they'll have enough, just enough slope for drainage, and, and that's about it. We're talking about, you know, reinforced concrete design. We're talking about large-scale structures. We're not really talking about houses and, you know, houses with sloped roofs. And, and houses and, and residential construction, we typically over-design those anyway. That's not really what we're talking about. Um, in order to determine the snow load on the roof, you take the snow load on the ground and you adjust it for a few different things. So uh, the, the snow load on, on a flat roof, P sub F, the pressure load, uh, would be the ground snow load times a few different factors. So 0.7 times an exposure coefficient, times a thermal coefficient, and times an importance factor. And, and we're going to get into what each of those mean uh, here in a second. So first off, let's talk about the exposure coefficient. Okay. So dependent upon the, the surrounding region uh, uh, of your given building, you're going to get um, a different, uh, you're going get, to get a different snow load. And the, the easiest way to explain that is to look at this, okay? Um, the snow load on a roof is going to tend to decrease if wind is blowing snow off of that roof, right? Well, the wind that strikes a structure is going to be a function of its exposure category. We, we don't have a category A. I, I don't really know why. We just, we just don't. We just don't. Um, it, it, I mean, we do. It's, it's really only used as a reference for if you've got to do wind tunnel testing. Like, I don't get why that wasn't, like, these weren't called A, B, C, and then that one was called D. I don't know. Just the folks who wrote the code decided to call that A. But, um, Depending upon your exposure category, you're going to get different uh, snow loads on your roof. Like, for instance, category D would be a structure along a coastal region. It's going to have different wind effects than, let's say, categories B and C. Category B would be a structure in a very heavy urban uh, environment where there's a lot of structures in the way versus category 
see, which is just sort of out in the open. So dependent upon your exposure category, uh, you're going to have a different exposure coefficient that's going to change the uh, um, uh, going to change the snow load on your roof. Now, a thermal coefficient, 99 times out of 100, this is one. But basically, if you have a heated structure, kind of like a, a good example would be something like a greenhouse. If you have a structure with a heated roof, well, heat tends to melt snow. Um, I know, surprising, right? But if you had a structure with a roof that has significant heat on it, that would melt the snow and it would reduce your snow load. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, the last one, uh, and this is a, a big category in ASCE in general, it is risk categories and importance factors. Um, based on the importance category of a given structure, based on the importance, we would actually bump up design loads a little bit. And let me kind of explain. So first off, most structures that you're designing as civil engineers would fall under risk category uh, two. This is general use structures. Okay, now let's take the worst case scenario, risk category four. Risk category four would be any structure whose failure would, would inhibit the community to necessary services. Um, so, so for instance, if I was designing a hospital, or if I was designing a police station, or a fire station, or a 911 call center, or something like that, that's a big deal. Okay, because if that structure falls down, that doesn't just affect the people in that structure, that affects everybody. Okay, like if the police station collapses. That's a big deal, okay? So right off the bat, the loads that we would use for the design of, let's say, a police station would be bumped up quite a bit versus, uh, let's be honest, if I was designing a structure for a grain silo or a, a barn or something like that, I mean, yeah, that, that sucks, but if a grain silo collapses, that's not going to be debilitating to a community like the loss of a hospital. Do, do you see what I mean? So most structures are going to be risk category two, but some of them are going to fall into some specific categories. So risk category one would be a structure that normally is unoccupied and isn't really going to uh, uh, have much risk to the public. Risk category three, okay, risk category three are structures where there's a large number of people in a building, and it's also buildings where the people inside uh, are going to have a hard time getting out on their own. So we're talking. So that's not funny. I don't get what's so funny about it. Because it's prisoners. You're right, yeah. <laughs> That's true. The prisoners are gonna have a hard time getting out. <laughs> We're week one into the semester, guys. You're right. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. No, we're talking about we're talking about places like like healthcare facilities, like assisted living care facilities. We're talking about elementary schools and preschools. We're talking about large occupancy structures like theaters, lecture halls, stadiums, places like that. Places where there's a lot of people and and you know they you know getting out on your own. I mean, if you, imagine if you had a stadium full of people and there was a massive event, getting them all out. Uh, at once, uh, that's a big deal. So the design of that structure would be handled a little differently than just a regular office building. So it's just something to keep in mind that, that we handle that uh, in, in uh, engineering as well. Another issue which I'm not really going to get super, super detailed in, uh, we might talk about this like in senior design you know, sometime next year if I'm teaching that, but one issue to deal with is snow drifts. Okay? Snow is, for the most part, um, at least for the snow loads that we get around here, the, the, the values that we get, we tend to find that, that in this area, snow can be idealized as uniformly distributed loads, um, just a single uniformly distributed load. But if you're, in a, if you're designing a structure in a region that has heavier snows, and has, uh, it can, uh, uh, you can have higher impacts, you kind of need to account for different load cases associated with just snow. One of those big load cases is snow drifts. The wind blows snow uh, on the roof, and what can happen is, depending upon the geometry of your roof, you can have snow bunch up along the curtain wall or along the, um, uh, along the equipment or, or any appurtenance on the roof, and you can get a load effect that looks something like this. So like you can see that right here on the roof. You can see there's kind of like a, uh, a flat snow load 
but then there's also this sort of triangular effect. Everybody kind of see that? Like, when are we going to see triangular loads? Well, there you go. That's when you see triangular loads. <laughs> well, I showed you that. So, so you can see that. And, and the, the calculation of snow drifts, can, it, it's a little involved. I'm not going to worry about that in here. It's not hard. It's just, you know, you have to learn it step by step. And we got other stuff to talk about in here, so I just wanted to mention it. All right. Now, let's talk about two more effects. Let's talk about wind, okay? Wind is one of the two main lateral loads uh, on a structure. It's also the one lateral load that every structure sees, every tall structure sees uh, uh, wind effects. I mean, the other lateral effect is earthquakes. We don't have to worry about earthquakes around here in West Virginia. We would if we were designing a structure in California or Western Kentucky or something like that and go, earthquakes in Western Kentucky? Well, let's show you something here in a second. Uh, but one of the things you'll find with wind is wind tends to get, uh, the effects of wind tend to get more pronounced as the building gets taller. Now, the base wind equation that you see, that you end up using for wind, uh, is what you see there, this point 00256 V squared. And if you wonder where that equation comes from, I have a feeling you all have heard of this thing called Bernoulli's equation before, right? Well, wind is a fluid, okay? If you take point A and point B, assume they're at the same elevation, so your elevation head goes out. You say point A, you have wind blowing on the building, so point A is the wind blowing on the building. It's blowing at a certain velocity. Point B, the velocity is zero, but you're trying to determine the pressure on the building, right? So point A has velocity but no pressure. Point B has pressure but no velocity. Take your Bernoulli's equation, solve for the pressure, take the uh, fluid being air, take your unit weight of air, and then throw in a unit conversion to take wind, which is in miles per hour, and convert it into pounds per square foot. And it's funny, funny how it comes out to 0 .00256. So seriously, that, that's, that's where this equation comes from. It's just Bernoulli's equation for air with some unit conversions thrown into it. it it's that simple. Um, <laughs> now, we have some adjustment factors that we throw on there. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, whether or not wind is striking the, the weakest direction of the building. There's a topic, uh, topographic factor we throw in there. And this is the one where we're accounting for height, this K sub Z term. The taller the building is, the larger the, the wind effects are going to be. Now, this is the, uh, the base wind speed map for, um, for the United States. Most of the country uses a base wind speed of 115 miles per hour, except for the coast. Why are the coasts using a higher wind speed? Hurricanes. So most of the country deals with 115 miles per hour. There are some special wind regions where the wind can get a, a, a bit bumped up. Uh, like I'm from uh, the Bluefield area in the southern part of the state. It's in a special wind region where you can get some wind speed up effect. So there's a you know, fat, random factoid for you, but that can, uh, that can happen. Okay, seismic loads. Let's talk about earthquakes. Okay, you're in the passenger seat of a car. Your friend is driving. They don't know what they're doing. They can't drive. They're driving 50 miles per hour. All right, they see something on the road. They hit the brake. What's the first thing you fling into? You're the one in the passenger seat. <laughs> You're wearing your seatbelt, right? No, the, no, the, no, the answer, the answer is yes. <laughs> no, the answer is yes. You're wearing your seatbelt, right? <laughs> Even there was a delay. <laughs> the answer is yes. Please wear your seatbelt. No, but, <laughs> but let's, let's talk about that effect a little bit more in depth, okay? All right, you're in a vehicle, okay? Your body has a certain mass to it, okay? Now, what happens when you hit the, uh, what, what happens when your friend hits the brakes is that your body flings forward. When the brakes are hit in the car, the, the car undergoes a sudden change in acceleration, right? Your body has a certain mass. Force equals mass times acceleration. That's what the seat belt has to withstand, right? Okay. 
Well, a couple, a couple analogies. Buildings undergo the same thing, okay? When an earthquake hits, the ground is moving. It's moving laterally. The, the building is being accelerated. Buildings are not made of feathers. They're very heavy structures, so they have a very significant mass, okay? The building is being accelerated, and it has a certain mass. The building experiences seismic forces as a result. Now, the other analogy is that instead of, um, uh, instead of uh, uh, you know, in designing the entire structure to withstand that earthquake, we don't design the entire car to hold you back in the event of a collision. We install a specific system in that car, and that's its role. The name of that system is a seatbelt. The whole car isn't holding you back. The seatbelt is. It's the same thing with the building. We install specific bracing elements or specific components in a building solely for the purpose of resisting lateral effects. The whole building isn't holding, uh, resisting those lateral effects, just a small portion of it. Now, dependent upon where you are in the United States, uh, you can have different seismic effects. So, so like for instance, if you're out in California or Nevada or somewhere like that, you have some very significant seismic demands. But there are also some very other interesting places that might surprise you. For instance, uh, if you go out to, to western Kentucky and whatnot, you can have some very significant seismic demands. That's, that region is not as seismically active, but it's near a fault line. If it were to go, it would be bad. So we have to design our structures accordingly. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Now, Alaska and, and Hawaii and whatnot, they're, they're obviously seismically active as well. So we've got some considerations to consider there. Any questions? All right couple things. So we've got these different components. We've got these different uh, uh, you know, dead loads, live loads, snow loads. How do we actually design with them? Well, the long and short of it is what we do is we feed these different load components into a series of load combinations. And the idea is that we pick the worst case scenario. So the ones that we're going to use the most, for most of the elements that we design in this class, we're really only going to be considering dead loads and live loads. That's really what's going to be the main bulk of what we deal with in this class. So I've got the two upper ones uh, bolded red because they're going to be the most common. Let's take the first one. The first load combination is just 1.4 times the dead. This is assuming that the structure is really only experiencing dead load, and this would be the load factor, this 1.4. This would be the load factor that we would need to... Uh, uh, to, deal, uh, to, to apply in order to assume a worst case scenario. Well, let me ask you a question. When do you think a structure is experiencing only dead load? There's a very specific period in a building's life that it's experiencing primarily dead load. Not after it's built. While it's being built. There's nobody in the building. This building isn't finished yet. For instance, if, I, if I'm erecting the beams to withstand these floor loads, well, there's no people in the classroom because there's no classroom yet. But there is a beam sitting there by itself having to withstand its own self-weight, right? So you have to consider that. Um, so, so, you know, load combo one is really relating to significant uh, a, a situation where you have a very high dead to live load uh, ratio. In other words, a lot of dead load, not that much live load, which is really going to be very common during construction. The second load combo is really more pertaining to regular everyday use of the structure. 1.2 times the dead plus 1.6 times the live. Now, some of these other uh, scenarios like live roof load or snow load or even rain load, um, they're there in the, in the specifications, but really we don't deal with them as much as we do just regular run-of-the-mill snow load. So these, these are the really the two ones that we're going to, um, uh, going to use this, uh, uh, this semester. And really the, the rule of thumb is that you would just go through all of them and take the, uh, take the worst case scenario. So if you ever see this equation in this box, it's really you know, load effect and load factor. So lo uh, you know, load factor, load effect, load factor, load effect, et cetera. And you just go through all of them and pick the, the worst case scenario. And as long as your strength is bigger than that, then, then you're good. Now, before you leave, because I know everybody's packing up, I do want to very, very briefly show you the, uh, the homework assignments. Everybody's aware of this. So I've got the homework assignment posted. There are three problems. Let me show you all something real quick. So problem three is just tell me what the ground snow load is at the University of Connecticut. So I think that's pretty easy. Um, prob no, everybody, everybody watch up here because you want to pay attention to this. Okay, problem two is just determining uh, 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 factored effects on this floor system 
due to just a load of 60 pounds per square foot, there's no load factoring. But problem one has some load factoring. So there's a dead load, a live load. The live load will need to be reduced, and then you'll need to factor it using the equation below. You've got to look at maximum factored moment on a floor beam and factored load on a column. For the column, just take the pressure times the area, and then you know, do that accordingly. Don't try and do the hip bone connected to the leg bone. It'll just take you way too much time to just pressure times area. Sound good? It's right, due on 20 seconds. And I've got them all up here as well. So, And what, one other point I will mention before you all leave. I know, I know you all are packing up, itching to go. But I, I am, for the most part, following this schedule on the syllabus very closely. So I mean, we have that assigned today, and it will be due that day. So I'd follow that as well. That's all I got, guys. You all have a great weekend. We'll see you when you get back.